Thank you so much for joining us today. We're doing myth busting. Does the mint thing really work on hive beetles? So we've got these mints here, right? And apparently, you can put them in the hive and it'll scare all the hive beetles away. So let's see, we've got Fruini here, who's going to take apart the hive and put the mints in. And just a little shout out, there's always been lots of women in beekeeping, International Women's Day today, and it's so good to actually see a real rise in the number of women keeping bees all around the world, so fantastic. Okay, so we're going to uh, take this top box off. Now, there's not a lot of uh, honey in it yet, so it should be fairly light to lift, which is good, but we may as well take the gabled roof off which will make it a little lighter and its neat handle is actually the the rear door here so don't forget you can use that as the handle looking straight in we get a good idea straight away of how full the honey is in this super and we can see they've been doing their job connecting all of the little parts together but they haven't actually stored much honey yet if any Lots of bees in there, really good sign. They're just waiting for a good milk to flow. And if you've got questions for myself or for Weenie, put them in the comments and we'll get to answering those traits. So you probably recognise her voice from every time you ring the line, she's always helping people out. She'll be reading out the questions. Okay, we're just going to put that box aside, we'll put it on the ground and on its end. That way we don't squash the bees on the bottom here. Okay, let's have a look at what's going on. What do you think so far? Oh, they're looking nice. Looking good. Let's see some pollen, pollen pants there. Yeah. Very cool. So a while ago they were a bit hungry. There wasn't any honey in the corners of the frames here. And that was a sign that they just really didn't have much forage to to find even though there was a lot of bees they weren't finding much nectar to turn into honey so let's pop one of these frames out and have a look and see whether they're storing some honey yet so for when he's going sideways first which is a great thing oh, to do yeah. because that makes it just easier to pull up that first frame sometimes if you just pull it up without going sideways first you actually pull the nails out of here what have we got? What have we got? Got some drones coming about. Some drone larvae. You can see some adult drones, little ones there. Mm, we've got a lot of nectar being stored over here. Mm. A few different size cells. We've got big ones they're storing nectar in and little ones they're storing nectar in. Beautiful. Very nice. Should we put that on the other side here? Yeah, that's a good idea. And we can keep Keep looking at that frame. Okay, these uh, shelf brackets double as a nice frame rest. I find it best if you put the end bars right on the high points. That way you can fit three frames on there and they just sit a bit nicer like that. Any questions, put it in the comments below. Also let us know where you're tuning in from. Oh, and there's the queen. we'll get to answering those. Fruini's spotted the queen already. She's a bit of a ninja when it comes to queen spotting. No, she's on this next one. She, she ran across? No, she, I just saw her. She was dancing around. Dancing around on the next frame. <laughs> there she is. She's just there. Look at that. Keen eye for the queen bee. Nicely mated. A little camera shy. <laughs> Give us a thumbs up if you can see the difference between the queen bee and the worker bees here. Notice how her steps are much larger. She struts along. It's often the way you pick her in amongst thousands of bees is her movement. Good colour. Neat. Mm, what have we got here? There we've got more drone cells. Just on the verge of being capped, you can see how big those grubs are. So they'll probably cap them today sometime. And then if you have a look at these ones down here, 
So drones take the 24 days and you can see where the centre of the cell is getting a bit lighter. So that's how you know they'll be hatching pretty soon. Whereas, see, that one's still pretty dense. Yeah, so there's a little bit of difference. Well, there's the queen again. There she is. And Very notice she's legs. walking on the worker brood there, and this is the drone brood. So it's a nice illustration of the difference between mm. drone brood, how they stick out proud of the frame, compared to the worker brood, which are capped flush with the frame. So we don't want the queen to be orphaned from the hive, so we might just leave that frame in. Pop her into it's there. best to keep her in the hive, because if she drops on the ground, there's a chance she might not make it back into the hive. You should leave your hive queenless and then you'd have to fix up that situation. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, fantastic. People loving that um, you were able to spot that queen, Fruini. Getting some great queen spotting thumbs up from, from everyone listening, mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic. And just wondering how long has um, this the swarm been in this hive for? So this one was actually yeah. caught in the springtime. I've had a pretty poor season, so they didn't get to fill the top box yet. The season's been coming and going, not a whole lot of honey here in the agri at the moment. We got the swarm on the mango tree up here, and we, we did a, a film that one. And we basically just dumped them in the box, just with the wooden frames, all uh, foundationless, and this is what they did. Isn't that incredible that they're just able to make all this beautiful comb and this is the one we keep showing where the comb guide actually <laughs> fell out. Oh. But it doesn't really matter because the bees drew it nice and straight anyway. Yeah. Very nice. Fantastic. Um, and hi to Sean who's watching from the UK. Must be late night or early morning for you. Oh, and Mark in Brisbane's asking, are those frames free of wire and wax foundation? They certainly are. They're simply just a wooden stick that should be at the top except for that frame, the wooden stick's fallen down. So it's called a comb guide. You put it right in where the foundation normally slides in at the top. You glue that in place or use some little nails. And the bees just use that as a guide and hang their comb. Because we're using a flow hive, we don't need that wire reinforcing. So we don't need to go through that tedious process of waxing and wiring our frames. So we don't need to spin them in a centrifuge anymore. So it doesn't really need that uh, reinforcement. So we, we can just let them do it perfectly naturally. Just give them a wooden frame and away they go. Yeah, you can, I don't know if you'll pick it up, but there's all eggs, all in that area. So you can see that's where the queen's been recently. Very nice, give us a thumbs up if you can see down those cells pretty hard to see a little tiny egg. It's like a little yeah. ant egg in the bottom of the cell. And I can see them here. And I can also see the royal jelly they're putting down there. The, the first uh, uh, three days of their life, they're feeding royal jelly, which is like mother's milk. The bees are secreting that and feeding that to the young larvae. And if they wanted to turn that be into a queen, they would keep feeding her royal jelly for her entire 11 days gestation as a grub, and then uh, mm. she would turn into a queen. She'd be super sized, big legs, the ability to lay a couple of thousand eggs a day. Uh, incredible that just through epigenetics, just through what she's fed, mm. will determine all of that. Now, mm. if she's fed plant proteins, which is bee bread, like all the workers are, she'll turn into a worker bee. Fantastic. So questions coming in from Kathleen, um, just on her own hive, saying they've got lots of wonderful um, brood and think it's really to, time to requeen the hive. How do you requeen if the current queen is still in the hive, even though they haven't actually spotted her yet? How do you requeen the yeah, hive? Yeah. So if you've so Kathleen's saying they've got a, a wonderful amount of brood, but they're wanting to requeen the hive. Yeah. Um, but how do they do it if the current queen apparently is still in the hive, even though they haven't spotted the queen? <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest part. Uh, yeah. um, I think when you're wanting to requeen a hive, um, there's no real roundabout way about it. You've really got to find the queen um, as hard as it is. 
um, you've got to take that queen out of there just because the pheromones are so different. So if you have a queen right colony, which a queen right colony is when um, the colony has a queen that's been accepted, you want that colony to be queenless for the new queen to be accepted. Um, if you put her in when the colony's queen right, um, the new queen or the workers will actually kill her. So then you're wasting that investment. Um, so it's really about just trying to get in and see if you can find the queen. She does look quite different. There are a few tips that you can look for online, but it really just takes practice and um, there's no other way to speed that up, unfortunately. So yeah, try and find that queen. Just go frame by frame and just take your time. And if you get really stressed and get really hot and bothered, then just have a break, have some water. The bees will be all right. And then just come back and go on to the next frame. But also when you're checking a frame, so if we go was but we could see we had pulled out just pop them back we had pulled out this frame and I knew the Queen wasn't on this frame but it was when I looked down here from this angle because her body shape is so different you can easily spot her if she's on that next frame and is on the middle of that comb so that's more often than less where you'll spot her it's rarely that you spot her like on that frame unless she's on this side which you're not seeing in which case you have to turn it around to be able to see it but usually you just gotta yeah understand her differences so that yeah you can try and get her if you can <laughs> and is that why Frey I know like we did a session with you a, a little while ago and you were marking queens I guess for yeah. some of us especially the over 60s we may need a little <laughs> dot on our queen you don't need a dot on your back. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, marking your queens is just a great way to know um, whether your hive's requeened or has superseded or whether it's the same genetics or not the same genetics going in. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the main thing about marking your queens. But yeah, it's really, it's hard um, requeening your hive the first couple of times because you think that the queen is the center of this whole organism and you're interfering with her and it can seem really daunting and like you're going to do the wrong thing but um it's going to be okay you can get another queen if that one doesn't work you might find that they don't accept that queen or after a while once she started laying again they might supersede her just because they don't like her um there's parts of beekeeping that you just don't know what the bees are thinking, but they're always doing it for a reason. So you've, you've got to trust that. I think. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Caro's asking, she's just curious to know why we don't shake the bees off the frame when we're inspecting them after we've assessed the numbers. Is it just because you're trying to keep them calmer and you're not trying to disturb them? Um, I think it really depends on the intention um, of your inspection. So if you're if we're just going through and doing a quick brood inspection monitoring the numbers of hive beetles because we're looking to see um, or trial putting those mints in so in this case there's no real need to shake the bees off the frames um, we've pretty easily seen that there's eggs and larvae of all different sizes we've seen the queen there's a good number of workers to drone kind of ratio in there so it's pretty good but if you're going through and say you're rotating your frames or say you really want to see if there's really like a lot of lot of eggs in there, then absolutely, yeah, you just shake the bees off that frame. So it's really just, um, yeah, what your intention for the inspection is really determines what the way you'll handle the frames and whether you'll shake those bees off or not. Fantastic. And Kathleen's just come back, who was the one asking about the queen replacing it. Basically, it's because their hive is not doing so well and it's struggling compared to our, the hive that you've just opened up there. So that's why they're wanting to requeen. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Obviously, um, when you're requeening, it's great that you can notice the signs of how your queen is performing. Um, but it's also important to remember that um, a really big part of it is environmental factors. And so your queen's performance will change throughout the year just depending on the floral resources that are available etc but if you're definitely having troubles with um, things like temperament or you're looking at her pattern so we can see on say this frame we'll shake the bees so this is an incident where we would shake the bees because we're looking at the pattern so when we're shaking the bees you can do it check if the queen's on there if you can if you haven't found the queen like if you do 
if we were going through and we knew that the queen was in that frame, so she wasn't on that frame, we could very easily just shake the bees out the front. But because we're not sure where the queen's gone since the time we saw her, we'll just shake them straight into the box just to save that risk. So yeah, like we've said in other videos, when you're shaking just like a short, sharp shake, like that. So that gets most of the bees off there. So if you're looking at pattern, or the pattern is a part of um, your queen's traits that you're interested in, then that's when you could shake the bees into there. And so we're looking at this frame and we can see that the bees are just starting to be born on this frame. So they would have been laid about 21 days ago. You can see them just chewing through that wax in their own time. That's a case when you would, might want to shake them off, and there's another one. Just know, you can you can actually see yeah. one on camera there, like it's actually about to come out. Yeah! Oh my goodness! <laughs> they're very cute, and you can see all the other bees. They're not making a fuss out of it. They're just going about their own way, quite beautifully. Like a just... bee breath. Oh yeah. Exactly, and then if you want to get those last few ones off, I've got the beautiful bee brush here. And so, um, I'm not sure whether it's just a myth or habit, but I was always told to brush bees going upwards, going up like that. Ah. And then you just rotate it around, rest them on there if you like. Just rotate them up. And then a few more on this side. Oh, she's got one into me. Alrighty. And then there's just like a couple that are hanging around on there. Generally you can just sort of oh look. She's just Nearly, you're nearly out. Thank you. <laughs> there she is, she's just been born. A worker bee born on International Women's Day. Look at her go. <laughs> she's very fluffy. Oh, look. <laughs> look at her go, yeah. And that's a fresh new bee just born. So you can see how light they are in colour. We've still got quite a bit of hair on her there. She's quite white, but she'll soon. Yeah, checking out what's going on. And it's so, just amazing that they know what they're doing. They do, Fran. So when will that bee like so, take a little flight and like exit the hive? Well, um, so the foraging period for the bee is actually right at the end of its life cycle. So it's going to start off. Um, in as a nurse bee it'll be feeding it'll be making wax and then it'll move from the sort of brew chamber out and become a guard bee and then it's only in its later life that it's actually out foraging so most of their life they're actually just in the hive in the dark <laughs> really <laughs> but um yeah and i guess a part of that is that often bees do pass away or um, their life comes comes to an end when they're out foraging but sometimes they do pass away in the hive and that's why often you'll see out the front of your hive or a few meters out the front of it the bees they wait until the actual bee has dehydrated so it's light in weight and then they fly it and deposit it of it outside the front elsewhere yeah oh Fantastic phrase. So in terms of numbers and we're getting asked, I get asked this quite a lot on the phone, how many bees do you think are in this hive? Oh, I've got no idea. <laughs> <Seeds. laughs> um, no, don't you count them? Full of bees. <laughs> a, a big colony might have up to 50,000 bees. So it's mm. incredible when you actually do the numbers on bees. Mm. This is a colony that started as a swarm and they're still building up. So my guess here is we've got 25, 30,000 bees between this box and the one that we've taken off. Yeah. So that's a, that's a lot of bees. Mm -hmm. And if you do some maths on it, right, and you go, let's say 
half of 50,000 bees decided to go out and do some pollination. And that means that if um, half of the bees did two trips to the flowers and each time they went to the flowers they did a couple of thousand flowers, which they can easily do, we've got 50 mm. million flowers pollinated from a single hive, which is just incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. So that's why the humans have taken them all around the world, wherever they go, because they're such incredible pollinators and they've become this amazing part of our food chain mm. that we're actually in big trouble without them. So hats off to the beekeepers for looking after the bees and keeping them going because we need the bees. Fantastic. So many comments, we, I think, from our US um, customers out there all getting ready to start their hives in April and Marty's just said he's received three Flow Hive 2 Pluses and his three queens are about to start ready to start on April the 1st for beekeeping in the US. Mm -hmm. So as we're sort of starting to, to slow down a bit, yeah. our, our US beekeepers are all starting to get sorted so um, and hopefully making use of our beautiful birthday sale which I think in the US ends either today or tomorrow, I'm not 100% sure but it's very soon. So, and with our new Flow Caddy that's just come out, which has had the beautiful bee brush in it that Fruini was just using on her Flow Hive. Fruini, question here is, will you pull all the frames out to check it, or now that you've spotted the queen and the pattern's okay, is that, do you need to pull all the frames out? Yeah, still pull the frames out. Um, yeah, the sign, the presence of the queen isn't the only sign that um, the colony's healthy and okay. Um, your colony can be doing really well and have a queen. I mean, your colony can have a queen, um, but it can still, um, when you're looking at those frames, you can find AFB, EFB, there's chalk brood, there's all sorts of um, other pests and diseases that you need to be inspecting for on, on those frames. So definitely finding the queen um, and seeing brood and larvae isn't the only sign that your colony's okay. It's good to go through and make sure and check for all the other pests and diseases that are relevant to your climate and area. Fan fantastic. Amy's a, a new beekeeper in the US and just wondering, and it might be a question for you and Seeds maybe, yeah. um, what, what's, what's the sort of best advice you can give for someone who's just beginning beekeeping? Oh, I'd probably say I don't know, I think there's a lot of things, but um, definitely getting a mentor. Um, I think beekeeping is just as complex as it gets just about. Um, so it's not easy. And so don't feel daunted or like really discouraged by that or the bees or the stings or anything like that. Because once you get past that point and you develop a level of confidence, um, it's really definitely a, a worthwhile and awesome hobby or profession to get into. Um, join your local beekeeping club, get some books, work with some beekeepers in your climate. Um, obviously we're here on the mid-east coast of Australia and that's quite different to climates in the US, let alone we've got Victoria which is just a state down south of New South Wales and we've got up north and just within those regions the type of beekeeping and the construction of your hive or the configuration of it can really change. Um, so yeah, get in touch with your local beekeepers. Beekeepers are pretty generous with their knowledge most of the time um, and often they need a hand extracting or wiring up some frames and so while you might not be in the actual hive, the conversations that you have outside of them are, are just as valuable, I think. Yeah. Fan, fan, fantastic. Um, great answer there for Aweni and Caro's coming in and that she was just looking, been spotting obviously all these brood frames that you're pulling out. Just notice that there's not what she could see, not lots of stores of honey for winter. Mm. And just wondering, as we are preparing to go into winter, um, would we consider, would we need to feed our bees? Um, I look, think she's in the US. Yeah. yeah. So our winters are pretty mild and we also get a bit of a nectar flow um, coming in most of the time, even though it drastically reduces compared to the spring and the summer. Um, looking at this hive, I definitely, I don't think it would be a need to feed it at this stage. Um, if we look at that outside frame, which I think was this one, you can see that all throughout here is all nectar in there. It's all, so it's in a sort of bridge shape that is sort of like that in around there. So that's all honey and nectar. 
that they're storing in there and as it gets cooler you will find that the bees will naturally reduce the size of the brood chamber and the honey will come in and they'll sort of do that at, at their own pace but yeah it is always hard to know whether can I harvest is it too late to harvest um, will they have enough stores in there maybe I should just leave it maybe I shouldn't just leave it yeah it's really hard to know but um, you just gotta I guess gauge the population compared to the weather pattern and what the forecast is over the next few weeks or months um, what floral resources may or may not be available and by the time you sort of line those two up and get some answers then you should be able to find an answer suitable to your bees in your climate. Fantastic Frey. Hey and Mark's just tuned back in, he was the one before asking about the wire and foundation yeah. and wondering does it take longer then for the bees to produce wax in the frames if you're not using the wire and wax? Um, look, uh, if they're on a nectar flow you can hardly tell. Um, I think obviously it does give them um, the foundation so it does mean that they just build it out straight as is but even when you put in the foundationless um, frames like this you'll find that the bees just kind of gradually build it build it down in a slightly different way than they would um, one with a foundation frame I don't think it takes any longer but just because the foundation is is so thin that it's not even like it's it's come built out though I think you can buy them in a plastic form so I don't think there would be much difference in terms of foundationless or non-foundationless in that sense um, it's really just more so yeah your preference that's really what it comes down yeah. to so much of beekeeping <laughs> is <laughs> which makes it so hard especially when you're starting out I think but yeah don't be discouraged by it and, yeah. and as Cedar said he'd rather spend time beekeeping than wiring and waxing Ex and <laughs> exactly right yeah yeah that's um, a common one um, we've got a question here I've got two deep frame supers and wanted to add a flow super yeah. where should it be placed on the top or in the middle They've got two deep supers and want to put then a flow super on as well. Flow super in there. Um, look, this might be one for seeds, but I guess for me personally, in my practice, in my climate, I prefer to under super. So um, this, if I've got the brood box and then this one, that super was completely full and I was going to add another super onto it, I would under super it. So this complete super would be up here and the empty one would be just below the brood box. Um, just because I think it's a lot less travel for the bees to go all the way up there and they're kind of going past this section here. Um, so they feel, well I hope that they feel the need to just deposit it there instead. So I'd be more inclined to put it um, somewhere in the middle. But what would you recommend seeds? I would actually recommend taking off some of the supers, that way you'll get a lot faster action on your flow frames. If you just add it to a hive that's already got a couple of supers on it, it'll be very slow mm. because there's not that real need to store a whole lot more. So take off one of the supers, or two if you like, and put on the flow super and then they'll be very quick to work it and store the honey. Yeah. Um, especially for just for that first time because they've got to wax it all up and make it their own and they might be a bit standoffish if there's plenty of other areas in the hive that they can work. Mm. And whether or not it goes under or on top is personal preference. Sometimes it's just ease. But beekeepers will generally under super and the reason why that is is bees like to store the honey sort of further away from the entrance and mm. I guess it's like storing that gold at the back of the nest where robbers are less likely to get to it. So in doing so, if you put the um, super on top, they might have to move all of that honey, which is a lot of mm. effort. Whereas if you put the super underneath, then it'll be slightly more efficient for the bees. Yeah. And fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Now Marty's tuned back in. Now Marty's given name is actually Martha, is the woman beekeeper with the three flow hives oh, that she's hello. just about to set up. Um, yeah. And now has asked another question, just wondering what sort of platform we've got this hive on because she's thinking of pouring a concrete slab. Mm. So just wondering what we've got this hive on. So this hive just on a, uh, a wooden table here because we ran out of room in the garden bed. I'll probably find a better spot for it eventually. The, in the garden though, because soil can be quite uh, soft, the soil can be quite soft when, it's, um, uh, when it rains especially, then 
great idea to put a brick. If you put a, a brick under each leg, then it will really uh, stop the hive sinking down into the garden. Pouring a slab you can do for sure. It's a lot more effort than just putting a few bricks in. Sorry, Steve, we're just having a bit of trouble actually hearing you, so we're just going to put a little, little microphone on you. Hey. Okay, good one. Perfect. Um, fantastic. Oh, we've just had a Stone Mays just tuned in who used to work and be behind the camera. Hey, Stone. <laughs> hey, Stone. <laughs> Come and visit us. Oh, that's better now, Seeds. I think maybe maybe it was just because of um, your, I don't know. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. All good, Karina. How are we going now? Of course, people are wondering about the mints. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. <laughs> what are we going to do with the mints? Where are we going to put them? And what's what's the geo of this? So here's the mints we got sent. Thank you. And what we're going to do, following. Uh, what people do out there in the world with the mint thing is just break them up into perhaps quarters. Easiest way to do that is when it's in the bag so it doesn't go everywhere. So you can hit them with your hive tool like this and that will break it and there we go, perfect quarters just like that. So uh, then all we're going to do is put our frames back in. So let's put the hive back together now and Legend has it that we just need to put a quarter of one of these mints in the corner of the, uh, of the box, just here at the top, on top of the frames. And we might, just for good measure, throw some right onto the bottom board as well. Now there's an opportune moment here where we've got a little bit of space mm. to drop, drop some down inside between the frames there. There we go, that went right through to the bottom board and then it's just a case of opening up this little minty treat and um, putting them right in the corners like this. Bearing in mind we want to do put this frame back in its right place like this then we can simply put our mints here and here and here. Now I assume the bees will like that little sweet candy treat, but <laughs> let's see how long it lasts. It'll be interesting to open it up again next week and see if we've got any hive beetles. I've only noticed uh, a couple in here, so it's perhaps not the best test because there hasn't been a whole lot of beetles, so we might have to repeat this, but that's how you do it. That is the mint trick, and we'll see whether it's a myth or not, whether or not it gets rid of those pesky hive beetles from the hive. So stay tuned for that one. Definitely. And they, those mint bricks were sent to us from Casey Dooley, who is hillbilly beekeeping in the state. And so Casey, hope you're tuning in. We're putting those mints in. And Chuck, you've been interested to know about this mint busting as well. Um, I wonder if the honey's going to taste minty. Oh, yum. <laughs> Yeah. Now there has been situations in the world where bees have brought back honey that was blue in the frame, red in the frame and green in the next frame and the beekeepers were scratching their head going what is going on and it turned out the bees were foraging behind a local M&M factory <laughs> getting the sweet goop from behind the factory and bringing it back into the hive so we might find that uh, there is a little minty flavour somewhere although there's probably not enough of it to really taint our honey too much. So, so we're just going to seize the moment now to put our top box back on and we can just brush those bees back into the hive like this, get them off the edges so we don't squash them when we put the top box back on. And Fawini's going to seize that moment now and away we go. That's it. Good one. Trying to line it up and look, there's a hive beetle right there. It's already oh, gotten out. It's already scared. It's already scared of the mint thing. <laughs> now let's put it on top here and put a mint near it and just see what See happens. which way it goes. Here we go. Now, if we, if we put it right in front of the mint, what's going to happen? Mm, not a whole lot. 
Here we go. Well. Mm. It's not, not exactly darting not away, is it? fleeing from its, for its life, <laughs> from the mint thing. In fact, it's crawling right under the mint. Put in the comments whether you think it is myth or not. Does the mint thing work for hive beetles? Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Now I think people are having a few problems hearing me, but that's okay. You guys can just uh, repeat, repeat the questions. Um, we've got a guy, Joe, had a, did a cut out hive, um, filled out seven frames, and it's been about three weeks now, and the frames have uh, brewed pollen and honey. Just wondering when would be a good time to add the super? Um, I guess, yeah, generally, once all your frames are fully drawn out, um, they've, they're, all the cells are occupied with something, whether it's honey, nectar, brood, pollen, or propolis, um, and the bees are just like really bearding outside of um, outside of your brood box, and that's the time to put on your super. Yeah, and definitely know like if you've got lots of rain coming, then obviously wait until the rains pass. If you know there's a dearth or there's going to be no floral resources coming in, then obviously just wait until you do that. Um, yeah, you just want to be sure that there's going to be enough bees to go up into the super to be able to police it and monitor those cells so any pests or diseases aren't going to, um, aren't going to take over the hive. Fantastic. Now Leanne's already tuned in saying the mint is a myth, so we'll wait <laughs> oh, and see. Yeah. Oh, that'll be interesting. <laughs> has she tried it? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, now Paul's asking, has a uh, couple of flow hives yeah. and the original hive swarmed yeah. um, is in, I'm not sure where Paul is actually. Um, the first hive is doing really well, but the second hive not so well. Mm. So his question is, can he move a brood frame from the old hive into the second hive with lots of brood to kind of mix, speed it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think that's one of the biggest biggest benefits of having more than one hive is that you can use them to support other colonies that might be um, a little bit weaker at that time or if they're queenless then putting in more brood or if they just don't have much brood then giving them that little bit more. Um, yeah I had the same thing where I made a split and the queen they made wasn't that great and then they had no eggs left in it because the time period between eggs being available wasn't there so I just transferred three frames of eggs from that one into the other hive and yeah I went in there and They've got a hatched virgin, two of them in there. There's still some eggs coming about. So yeah, you definitely use, use it to support each other. But obviously um, inspect for pests and diseases in each of those hives. Generally like um, the, what we call barrier systems is how you keep all your tools and what's it from one apiary all in the at one same apiary so if you're um, collecting brood then keep it within these two ones um, if you were getting brood from another apiary then it might be slightly different and you want to check for that extra carefully but yeah you're more than welcome to if it's the same apiary um, also depends yeah your state or yeah country might have different regulations in terms of um, pests and disease management that might limit your ability to be able to support colonies and the way honey and frames are moved about as well, so check on that. Oh, brilliant. And look, a couple of people tuning in saying, hey, with the mints, one, could you plant mint around the hive? And the other one is, could you wet the mint? <laughs> We're going to have a series. I know. <laughs> we are. Maybe we should put a hive in the middle of a mint patch. I think we should. <laughs> Thanks, Casey, yeah. for starting the whole mint myth buster. I think so. We can do different <laughs> types of mint as well. See whether one works better. <laughs> oh, That's funny. Very good day. Now, Burns asking, have you ever tried using handy wipes in the hive? If you just put a strip of the top or the between the frame, for some reason, it attracts the beetles. Yeah. You pull it out and dispose of it, burn it, and that helps keep your beetles down. Yeah, um, yeah, I have heard of chucks cloths, if that's what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I've seen chucks cloths used in hives um, at the, in various apiary sites. Um, yeah, they just get a sheet of the chucks cloth, put it on top of their super. Um, generally, before they put it on top of the super, they um, get a bit of wire or something to scruff it up a bit so it's got some texture. Um, then, as the beetles are crawling in amongst it, you will often find that there'll be quite a bit of dead beetle in the top of that chucks cloth. Um, yeah, do be careful about the amount of roughness you give to it because if it's too much, it can get the bees caught on it a little bit. But it's definitely a pretty 
um, economical way to monitor your hive beetle numbers. Yeah. Fantastic. And so look, many solutions. So many. And look, here's another <laughs> so one. Paul suggesting, and yeah. from the sunny coast in the hinterland, oh, yeah? it uses Beautiful. peppermint oil, and it seems to be okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Where does he use it? Well, oh, good point, Paul. <laughs> Get a bit more information, thanks. No, I'm just interested. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> so now that you've opened up this hive and you've found the queen, um, do you feel like, for any, it's a nice, healthy hive, and were, were you happy with those brood patterns that you saw? Yeah, I think it's a pretty good hive. Um, yeah, lots of things to see, quite a good population in there. Uh, lots of pollen coming in and different colours of pollen like we saw. Um, there's lots of larvae, lots of eggs. Um, so yeah, they're doing pretty well. They're doing pretty well. Oh. I guess um, I'd be tempted to, there was those few frames in the centre that had quite a bit of drone comb on them. So I'd be tempted to move them sort of towards the outside, just manipulate the brood to stick them on the outside and then get that fresher ones so all the all of the straight comb that's just worker comb is all together in this brood box because drone comb you often find it on like the edges or like the bottom of the frames just because they um, actually prefer it to be one degree less than worker brood so that's why it's often not in the center um, the times that it is in the center is when the bees have drawn out those frames and they needed drones at that exact time so they've just made drone cells as they were drawing out that Home. Oh, yeah. brilliant. Now, look, Stone's throwing a curly question at you, Fruini. No. Stone's asking, do you think that by helping with beetles, you're weakening the colony's overall resilience and strength? I think that's an interesting one. <laughs> ah, Stone, it was a curly one. Cricket. <laughs> um, I think um, it really, I think for starters, you're always, you're going to expect to have beetles in your hive at whatever time of the year. Um, there's going to be some percentage of beetles in your hive definitely i think that when it is depends on the time of the year but when it's raining um, there's not a lot of honey coming in there's a lot of the bees are eating the honey so that there's a lot of exposed cells and stuff i think at that time when hive beetle numbers could, could easily just like go through the roof then that's when you really need to support your colony um, i think we know how to work with hive beetles, but obviously we get slime outs all the time, so we have to implement some sort of management um, when it gets to a particular point, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers it, mate. Yeah, <laughs> bring up Ferwini. Um, Dave's just tuned yeah. in and just wondering, Dave has two native beehives yeah. on the hinterland property, yeah. and just wondering how, if you've got a flow hive uh, with the Italian honeybees, do they compete with each other? They don't generally compete. Um, I think generally there's enough floral resources for them to be able to coexist. They operate and go for different floral resources themselves and they're obviously a lot different in size so when you're doing things like um, macadamia pollination, they, lots of the macadamia farmers will have native beehives on their property and then they'll also get a whole lot of European honeybees put in and just because so if the flower is sort of like this, it doesn't really look like that, but just imagine that it does sort of look like that, then the European honeybee can only go this far sort of down because it gets too big to be able to get all the nectar down to here, whereas the tiny little tetragonula caminara ones, they can go all the way to the bottom of that. So um, they can coexist really well, um, particularly to pollinate certain, certain plants. But yeah, if you've got both, I don't think there's going to be too much of an issue. Do you think there will be? No, See? I think it's fine. I've got yeah. both the the native sugar bag bees at home and also plenty of the European bees and I don't find any issues. You do see them foraging on the same flowers together sometimes, which is um, which is fine and they don't seem to be fighting at, at that point. I have seen once the native bees trying to get some honey out of the flow hive. So if anything, <laughs> that's the only way around I've seen it. Oh wow, because compared to the native bees, how much honey do native bees produce compared to say the Italian European bees? Yeah, a lot less. I think yeah. generally they only produce three to five kilos a sort of season. So yeah, you think about that, you sort of almost get that out of one, one and a half low frames. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot less, yeah. Yeah. It is. You can only really harvest, say, half a kilo or one kilogram from the sugar bag bees. Otherwise, you're, you're really stressing them out. So, mm. so 
often I get asked whether we're going to invent something to harvest them in an easy way, but it's really hardly worth it with the amount of honey you get out of those colonies, but still very cool and the honey is amazing, it tastes very medicinal. They actually mix the pollen and the honey together, whereas the European honeybee separates that and makes bee bread and honey separate, so mm. it's a very spicy kind of honey. Yeah, yum. Fantastic. And lucky last question, Frey, for you. Mm. Um, Frey, in beekeeping, what are, what's the sort of favourite, what do you like doing most when you're beekeeping? Oh, the thing I love most when I'm beekeeping is, yeah, getting into the brood box, yeah. It's just the funnest part. It's so interesting. You never know what you're going to find. Um, well, you hope you know what you're going to find, but sometimes there's a few curly ones in there. And it's just really exciting. Um, really, what happens in here is a reflection of what you're going to get and be able to harvest up here. So if you can work with this um, to make it perform to the best of its ability, um, then yeah, you'll benefit right here as well. So yeah, that's my favourite part of beekeeping. But I also love just sitting with a cup of tea and watching them come in. <laughs> yeah, so that's a nice part of beekeeping too. Oh, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> and is it always the bonus when you spot the queen? Yeah, it is. But it does sadly get a bit less and less exciting. But it's still very exciting. Like you still, like it's like this and then you spot the queen and it's sort of like, ooh. <laughs> but like, you know, when you kind of first do it, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Perwini, for the oh. show and tell. I learned some things inside the, the brood nest here. And thanks so much for everyone tuning in and helping each other because it's an amazing thing that the community out there, when there's a question, they'll be straight away answering. And it's so great to see this worldwide community yeah. of, of beekeepers helping each other along mm. their way because if we help the new beekeepers, yeah. which beekeepers love doing, then that helps the next generation get going, get on their feet. And that way we can look after enough honeybees in our world to do all of the pollination yeah. that we need. So super important there. Absolutely. If you need an excuse to start beekeeping now is a good time <laughs> because we do have a sale ending today. So if you need an excuse to get going with the Flow Hive, then jump on our website, have a look. And also if you want an in-depth training course that's made to take you from square one right through to a, a deep scientific knowledge, then have a look at the beekeeper.org. Experts from around the world contributed to that program and it gets rave reviews. Also an amazing fundraiser. Yeah. We've planted over a million trees to create literally billions of safe blossoms for bees to forage on. And we're gonna keep going, supporting great initiatives around the world to look after not only the European honeybee, all of the native species that really rely on forage of all sorts so mm -hmm. it's a great thing to tune in on have a look and thanks again Pruini, oh, and a shout out to all of the women beekeepers out there on yeah. international women's day we've got uh, a rise in numbers which is great to see so fantastic yeah. let us know whereabouts in the world you're tuning in from and also if you've got anything you'd like us to cover today we did the mint thing and whether it's <laughs> going to get rid of those pesky hive beetles so tune in again next week and we'll have a look at how that's going yeah.